It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Dan Berlay. Dan, where are you? Dan is the founder of Breath Mastery. He is Tony Robbins' coach, and he has just come directly to us from five countries. He was in Prague last. So it is truly my honor to introduce Dan to you. Dan, over to you. <sighs> yeah. So I got the craziest job in the world. I teach breathing. And, uh, but breathing is one of those things like balance. It cannot be taught, but it can be learned. So I have a friend in Moscow who's 20 years already, 25 years I've had this friend. He's, he's all things Chinese. He's, he owns a Chinese tea house. He publishes a Chinese magazine. He collects Chinese art. He practices Chinese medicine. The guy is just all in for Chinese. And so we had this conversation. How do you teach something that cannot be taught? but can only be learned. Like whistling. When I was a kid, my father used to take his two fingers and, and somehow he got this wicked cool whistle out of that. I tried that forever. Never got anywhere. But you know, you play with it, you do something, and all of a sudden it slips out, and then you lose it, and you try to find it again, but pretty soon you got it. So whistling is something you can't teach, but you can learn. Balance is something you can't teach, but you can learn. And here I am teaching breathing, which can only be taught and can only be learned. So me and my, me and my Russian friend decided, we, we talked it over over years, and we finally arrived at something. OK, how do you teach something that can only be taught? Well, you tell people stories. You give them things to practice, and you leave the rest up to God. And so that's what I've been doing. I have written an article about breathing every month since June of 1976 when I was at the University of Massachusetts. I haven't missed a month yet since June of 1976. I'm obsessed with breathing. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a missionary for the breath. I'm obsessed. I was the kid at five years old who was having the breath holding contest in, in kindergarten. That was me. I drowned several times, had to be resuscitated the last time. I was a deep sea diver in the military. I mixed gases for breathing. I mixed helium and oxygen for diving. My first job was an x-ray technician, and one of the easiest x-rays to take is a chest x-ray. And when you take a chest x-ray, guess what you tell the person? Taking a big breath, hold it, and then click, you take their picture. Well, I probably took 3,000 chest x-rays in two years, and everybody did something different. The muscles they used, the expression on their face, what they thought was a full breath, what they went through to accomplish a full breath, People don't realize just how much they're giving away about who and how they really are through their breath. We've learned to disguise the look on our face. We smile because it's polite, but on the inside, we probably often don't feel like smiling. You know, I look tough, but I'm really scared and stiff. So we disguise our body language. You ask somebody, hey, how you doing? Fine. Whoa, that didn't quite align. But we try to put on a good face. We put on a good front. We look tough. Very few breathing masters on the planet. And so people don't realize just how naked they are, in, in, in my eyes, when they're breathing. So uh, how do you know you're breathing? Huh. How do you know you're breathing? Well, close your eyes right now and focus on the tip of your nose. And just position your awareness there. And notice the breath coming in. Notice the breath going out. And look for details. There are points in the breathing that you've never observed. And some of those points are like doorways, like a key to a new consciousness, a new reality. But they're very subtle. So what exactly do you feel when you focus your awareness on the tip of your nose and you breathe in and you breathe out? Don't think about it. Just see if, let those feelings register. You might notice it's cooler coming in and warmer going And then bring your awareness a little deeper, say towards the bridge of your nose, deeper into your nasal passages, and monitor the breath from there. So you start at the tip of the nose, and now you're bringing your attention further into your nasal passages, bridge of the nose. 
And notice and feel, those are touch points on the breath. And then bring your attention to your sinuses and your skull. And try to experience the breath as it comes and goes from that touch point. Your sinuses and your skull. Maybe there you begin to get a light experience. Maybe it's not a feeling. Maybe something starts to sparkle. You start to see something bright. And then pick up the breath when it passes through your throat. Can you feel the breath as it passes through your throat? And then create a little loop of awareness. Tip of the nose, bridge of the nose, sinuses and skull, throat. Just like a little wheel. Tip of the nose, bridge of the nose, sinuses and skull, and throat. And just breathe in and out and sense the breath. Touch the breath from all those places. And then pick up the breath up on here on your collarbones. And now you sense the breath is in, in the form of movement. And, and on purpose, create a little extra movement there under your collarbones. Let that place be soft and flexible and available to the breath. There are some subtle feelings, early infant feelings live up there. Is that place alive in you up under your collarbones? Is the breath free up there? Can it move? Is it supple? Is it available? And then pick up the breath in your lower ribs. And this is where a friend of mine, Wilson Branch, would talk about horizontal breathing. Where you expand, you feel the expansion side to side in your lower ribs. You might even put your hands there. See if you can feel that side to side expansion. And can you get the breath all the way down into the floor of your pelvis? Can you feel some aliveness, some movement? Low. You know, in China they call it Dan Xian, in Japan they call it the Hara. It's the center of gravity in the body. Can you create some aliveness with your breath down in your lower belly, the tip of your tailbone, and your perineum? So that was a sigh of relief. When do people take sighs of relief? Well, I think it's the University of Nebraska or Midwestern University Medical Center about 20 years ago did a study on sighing and they came to realize that about 12 times a minute, uh, 12 times an hour, or about every five minutes, you take what we would call a physiological sigh. And that's an inhale that's twice as big as normal. That extra stretch, that extra expansion, that's what causes what we experience as a sigh of relief. So knowing what a sigh of relief is right now, give yourself one. Give yourself an inhale that's twice as big as normal. Extra stretch, extra expansion. And then let go. And then when you let go of the breath, let go of your jaw. Jaw is a signal muscle. When you release the jaw, other muscles get the message. And if you release your jaw at the moment you release the exhale, then you just relax, you're, you're relaxing the jaw at the same time you're relaxing the diaphragm. Oh, thank you, John, yawning. That's what I was waiting for. Appreciate that. I love when people yawn when I'm talking. It's like, you know, that's the opposite of politeness. How dare you yawn? I've got something important to say. What, am I boring you? <laughs> no, I'm alive, thank you. <laughs> hey, yawning is yoga. You notice when you yawn? It relaxes. You got permission. Let's make yawning great again, okay? <laughs> like, you know, we've been taught that yawning is it's not polite, it's not appropriate, you gotta wait for it. And even if you yawn, people do the yawn. They don't even let it happen. Well, you know what the root of the word inspiration, expiration, respiration? Spirit. So if you are stifling your yawns, you're literally stifling the spirit of life that's trying to live through you. You know, sir, thank you. I love that one's a good yawn. I, I, I grade yawns. I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a perfect yawn yet. I, I don't want to you know, put you down or anything, but right now, you know, on, on a scale of one to ten, I've seen a couple of fives. Yeah, you know. I don't want to be too judgmental about your yawns, but maybe you're just not trying hard enough. So I want what it here's an advantage.
advanced skill. And honest to God, I created this, I, I invented this about 15 years ago, the first time the Navy SEALs uh, hired me, the SEAL to Training Center in San Diego, hired me to come and breed with their guys. When I was, I don't know if you get or a veteran, when I was in the military and I tried getting people to think about breathing, they were all there's that thing like breathing, schmeeding, like yoga, schmoga, meditation, meditation. It took 40 years or so, but right now, um, uh, it's necessary. People who work in high stakes, life and death situations are trained to breathe. There's lives can be lost, millions of dollars at stake. Right? Look at an athlete, you know, just they curl their toes over the edge of the diving board and they get ready for an Olympic dive. And what's the last thing they do before they dive? They take a breath. It's not an accident. Look at basketball players before they do that free shot. Do, do, do. Breathing brings our energy and our attention together. Whenever you bring energy and consciousness together, something is created. That is the creative process, bringing together energy and consciousness. And something materializes, manifests, something you create. So what are you thinking about while you're breathing? The mind gets its creative power from the breath. And what I've learned is that life is waiting to give people the full power of the breath until they can be trusted with it. You wouldn't put a gun in a child's hands, they wouldn't know that it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> and so, you know that analogy that the mind is just the tip of the iceberg and the only part we use is a little piece and all that below the surface, we haven't tapped that surface. That's much more true of the breath than it is anything else. Most people are just breathing enough to, to survive. It's like the pilot light on an oven. You know, a little gas, little flame, pilot light on an oven. It, it, it's enough to keep you alive, but you can't cook anything with it. And that's the level of most people's breathing. So you've got to turn your breath up. You've got to turn your breath up. And so uh, the first time I got invited, and I didn't try to force it down your throats, I got invited to go and teach work with the Navy SEALs. I was thinking, wait, I've got to think of something good for these guys. They pay me so much money. What am I going to talk about? I had no idea. And when I got in front of the group, I said, I <sighs> suddenly yawned and I thought, wow, I just yawned and I took a sigh of relief at the same time. And so I said, I got an idea for you guys. This is something I've been practicing for a long time. I just did it for the first time then. I realized you put the yawn together with a sigh of relief. So, you know, yawning is something. Make yourself yawn right now. Everybody, you can do something to your jaw, something to your throat, and you can trigger a yawn. You can suppress a yawn. But you notice when it's happening, you can't get out of your system. What else is like that? How about emotions? You can trigger an emotion, you can suppress an emotion, but boy, when it's coming up, it's hard to get out of the way of it. And so, the two basic, you know, I wish I had 20 days with you, I got 20 minutes. So let's start with, with real basics, because even the greatest musicians, they practice the scales before they perform. And, and the higher you want to go, the better you want to get, the more often you have to return to the basics. And what is more basic than breathing? So, what I want you to do is just give yourself this big sigh of relief. I want it to be dramatic, theatrical, Shakespearean sigh of relief. Right? Imagine yourself as a Shakespearean actor, you come up on stage, you have no words in the play, you have to give yourself the yawn <laughs> and a sigh of relief that everybody on goes, oh, I wish I could. Because your lizard brain is your audience. Your amygdala, your this ancient part of our crocodile brain is watching and monitoring every breath you take. And so you're sending messages to your nervous system with every breath you take. You want to stop being conscious of the kind of messages you're sending. So take the most beautiful look. Take your time on the inhale. No rush. Already the lizard brain goes, whoa, no hurry. There must not be an emergency out there. Take a long time on your inhale. Take your time. Feel the expansion side to side. Talk to bottom, front to back. And then let go. And let go of your shoulders. Let go of your jaw. At the moment you release the breath, release a muscle, release a joint. And the, and the toxins and the energy that's trapped in your nervous system, the breath's going to pick it up like a flowing river and take it right out of you. But you're going to be letting go in that moment. 
I live in the Baja down in Mexico, Los Cabos, and it's dry tropics, very hard, packed, mineral-rich soil. And so when it rains or when the water comes down from the mountains, it just washes along the surface. But if you turn the soil, if you loosen the soil, when it rains, the soil drinks up the water. So relaxation is half the work in breath work. I think I'm teaching breath work. Half the work in breath work is relaxation. So pull in energy on purpose. Fill yourself up on purpose. Take a bigger breath than usual on purpose. And then when you let go, really let go. You, you might even wiggle something while you're exhaling. Just shake and wiggle something. Big breath in. A real quick story I just want to share with you. I, I got this book, one of my teachers was passing through my house back in 1980, and, uh, and he, I saw this book, he was working through his stuff in the back of his van, and it was a book with a picture of this Chinese guy on the cover, and said, A Brief Introduction to Chinese Medical Breathing Exercises. It was a book on Qi Kung. And I don't know, there was something about the guy's face. I grabbed that book, my friend Leonard, and I said, he said, oh, I haven't read that yet. I said, well, you're going to be here for a few days, so I'll, I'll read it and give it back to you before you go. He never saw that book again. It was one of those books that you start underlining things and circling things and highlighting things and pretty soon you're writing in the margins and then the whole book is circled, the whole book is highlighted, the whole book is underlined. And there was one exercise I loved in there. It was called prolonging the inhale. Prolonging the inhale. And over three years, I got up to a four minute inhale. I can inhale for four minutes without stopping. Pretty cool. And when I first traveled in Russia, I felt like a circus pony. Hey, show us that eternal inhale, man. Like, so, as it turned out, there was a problem with the translation in the book. And it wasn't prolonged the inhale, it was postponed the inhale. <laughs> so for three years, I mastered prolonging the inhale, and it wasn't even a thing. But that's the beauty of breath work. Nobody can do it for you. And if you start to tune into your breath, and you start noticing details, you're going to start noticing other things because the more conscious you become of your breath, the more conscious you become of everything. The more aware you are of your breathing, the more aware you are of your posture, your words, your environment, your surroundings. Breath awareness leads to awareness of your habits, your patterns, your fears, everything that's trapped in your nervous system, everything that's around you, your, your your situational awareness increases. So when do we take a sigh of relief? We take a sigh of relief when we're in pain, and the pain goes away. Up until then, the pain locks up the breathing. And when the pain goes away, what happens? You don't think about it. You don't do it. You don't make it happen. It happens because you just went from a state of pain to a state of no pain. And that breath naturally expressed itself. When else do you hold your breath? You hold your breath when you're afraid, when you're in a panic. <laughs> and when the fear goes away, what happens? <sighs> the breath opens and expands, and it flows again. Well, it occurred to me when I was working with guys in the military, holy crap, every time they went from a state of pain to no pain, or fear to no fear, this breath naturally expressed itself. I thought, listen, why don't we use this breath? And maybe we can make pain go away. And maybe we can make fear go away. It's a two-way street, and that's the magic of breath work. Every emotional state, every psychological state, every physiological chemical state has a corresponding breathing pattern, an associated breathing pattern. When you identify that breathing pattern, you get your hands on dynamite. You can change a state with just two or three breaths or one breath if you're really good at it. And you know that. When you're peaceful and calm and feeling wonderful, your breathing has a certain quality, it has a certain pattern. When you're angry and upset and afraid, it has a totally different pattern. We see this. It's a two-way street. Change your, when your state changes, your breathing pattern changes. Change your breathing pattern, you change your state. It's that easy. So the synopsis of my book, the basic idea of my book, Just Breathe, um, is all the high states and the extraordinary abilities that we normally associate only with the great saints and the mystics and the warriors and the gurus,
those same high states and extraordinary abilities are available to everybody with a belly button. And the breath is the key to unlocking that potential. And so my job is to travel around the world and seduce and cajole and slap and shake and do anything I can to make people breathe. Because the more you breathe, the more alive you are. And, and the more you get conscious of your breathing, the more you get conscious of everything. And there are breathing patterns and breathing qualities that are associated with really high ecstatic states. And when you identify those breathing patterns, you have, you have a way to get into some of the most beautiful, peaceful, sublime states and the most ecstatic states. There's an ecstatic nature to the breath. And if you want to know the major skill that, that can't be taught but must be learned, is the merging of the outer breath which is air, and merging that with the inner breath, which is spirit. If you can, if you can hack that, if when you're, if you can merge the outer breath, which is air, with the inner breath, which is spirit, you have just unlocked intuition. You've unlocked an key to becoming more loving, more compassionate, more peaceful, more calm, more energized. And here's the thing I learned from the Navy SEALs when I taught this thing, combined yawning and sighing. Before I do it, they just like, before I leave, I'll just try it, just, just for a couple of minutes. See if you can trigger the yawning reflex. And when it happens, give yourself a big sigh of relief while the yawn is happening. So the yawn opens something up in your throat that you can't open directly. And so you want to trigger the yawning reflex and then breathe through that opening in your throat. Try it. See if you can make it happen. The Navy SEALs paid me $10,000 to teach them that. And now it's become a thing. You get six guys together, they, they, they're breathing together, they're yawning together, they're sighing together, and it creates a bond like nothing else. I look somewhere and you have an urge to look there. I sense something and you feel it. It creates, you know there's a beautiful, I'll with this, there's a beautiful spiritual idea that we're all connected. We're all one. Isn't that a beautiful spiritual idea? But how many people, is, is that your actual experience? Well, you know what? The breath that's inside of you right now was inside of her just a couple of minutes ago. The breath that's inside of you was inside of him just a few minutes ago. We can't hide from each other. Literally, the breath that's in you right now, circling through your body, it was in somebody else's body. You can't get more intimate than the breath. And... If you have a, there's a book called Caesar's Last Breath, and the science proves it. Literal molecules of air that circulated in the Buddha's body, Jesus' body, Krishna, the great saints, the ancient people, some of those literal molecules of air are circulating in our body right now. We're all sucking off the same bubble of air on this planet. And it connects us. It's not just a pretty spiritual idea. The breath connects us. It connects our mind to our body. It connects our subconscious mind to our conscious mind. It connects us all to each other, and it connects us all to God and the source of life. And we need to wake this realization up. We need to live from it, because that's the end of violence. That's the end of war. When I feel my connection to everyone, how can I hurt anybody? So I hope you breathe. I hope you practice. I don't understand it. Amazing. Let's give a huge thank you to Dan Boulay.